Our lectionary reading this morning from Isaiah chapter one is the beginning of our journey towards Advent and Christmas. This being the fourth Sunday before Advent. And so our minds turn to Advent hope, Christmas hope. It's the coming of salvation in the birth of the Savior. We are saved into the good news of great joy for all the people. One of the reasons that the good news of the Advent hope is so joyful is that the messed up reality of what is and what was is so miserable. And Isaiah shines a light on the desperate woe of reality. Our little Wednesday morning fellowship group are working our way through the book of Isaiah. And I think we are enjoying it. We're certainly uh, enjoying the, uh, the scope of Isaiah and his... Uh, just just the you know it's it's a book of 66 chapters a book of 200 years a book of of so much that is so familiar but it is also a book with warnings and misery or to put it another way isaiah is a prophet and the prophets of God are different to the priests of God. At their best, the priests take the prayers of the people and bring them into God's presence. Prophets take the words of God and bring them to the people. And in this time, God's word for God's people is a word of concern a word of judgment. Isaiah is written in a time of upheaval and chaos for the nations of Judah and Israel, divided for so long. And here Isaiah writes of the desolation of the land, probably reflecting on the 8th century attacks of Assyria that have destroyed the northern kingdoms and left little Judah little Jerusalem, surrounded and on its own. Or as Isaiah puts it, Zion left like a booth in a vineyard, left like a shelter in a cucumber field. We're more used to the biblical descriptions of Zion as this great city on a hill, this place where the light of God shines and the nations of the world are drawn to it something has gone desperately wrong for Isaiah to describe Zion as a shelter in a cucumber field. This is a besieged city, a city at war, a city surrounded by enemies so strong. And Isaiah brings God's word to God's people. And if it, as, as if it's not enough that he has described Zion as a rough shack, a shelter in the field, something temporary, something that could be blown over in an instant. In, Isaiah then decides to refer to Zion instead as two of the most famous cities in the stories of Genesis. Or as Isaiah puts it, if, in fact, if there had not been a few survivors, it would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. The people hearing this know what is intended. It's not just the action of enemy kings that means that Zion, Jerusalem, is under pressure. Any more than Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by some random volcanic eruption. Rather, God needs to rescue God's people from themselves, not just Assyria. 
just as the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which, just in case you're wondering, has absolutely nothing to do with LGBTQ rights in the 21st century. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah has absolutely nothing to do with the history of homosexuality. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is a story of a city rampant with violence. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is the story of a, a city which wishes to rape its visitors. It's a vile story and a story in which God through the auspices of Abraham and Abraham's pleading in Genesis 18, God rescues Lot and Lot's family from the cities before they are destroyed with this outpouring of fire and sulfur that sounds all the world like a volcanic event. But these are not simply explanations given to natural processes. God is at work, rescuing Lot's family in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And here, God is at work, seeking to rescue the people of God from themselves, from the way they have perverted God's love, God's peace, God's joy, God's justice and made it into something so very different. God needs to rescue God's people from themselves, not just Assyria. Isaiah condemns the false religiosity of the people. Their incessant singing and festivals and sacrifices and prayers, nothing wrong with any of that, unless you are doing it with hands covered in the blood of your neighbors. God will not listen, says Isaiah, because their hands are full of blood. There's nothing wrong with the religion of the people. There's everything wrong with believing that somehow because you sing the right songs, somehow because you go through the right rituals, you have license to live as if the people around you are not your neighbors, as if the people around you are not also created in God's image and likeness. God will not less listen, says Isaiah. So wash yourselves, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice. And what does justice look like for Isaiah? Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Justice to Isaiah is about creating a society in which the marginalized are centralized. Those on the outside are loved on the inside. Seek justice, says Isaiah. Rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. I mean, of course, none of this has any relevance or resonance with us today, does it? Where we live in a nation where instead of the oppressed being rescued, they are threatened with deportation to a country they've never even heard of. Where instead of defending the orphans, we have ongoing safeguarding reports that tell us that for, for decades, young children have been horribly abused. We plead for the widow at a time when people can't even afford to put their heating on. Where is the justice? Well, Isaiah spoke to his people and told them that God would not put up with this. 
but he wasn't one of those prophets that simply said, it's all desperately bad and you've had it. So much as one of those who says, it's all desperately bad. But there is a solution. There is a redeemer. There is a savior. There is a way forward. And it doesn't require grand schemes. It requires you to turn. Come now. Let us argue it out, says the Lord. Although your, scar your sins were red as scarlet, they shall be as snow. Your sins become clean again as wool shining in the spring sunshine. Why does this passage from Isaiah appear in our lectionary as we begin the journey towards Christmas? Because Christmas is far from being just a cultural holiday. Christmas is far from being the celebration of a historical event that has limited interest to us today. Christmas is the story of God sending himself into the world that we might not only hear, but have the courage and resources to respond. And the story of Christmas is the continuation of the story of Isaiah. As Isaiah himself was the continuation of the story of Abraham and Genesis. And on the centuries go and still God speaks. And God therefore says to us, not simply to Isaiah's hearers, come, let us argue it out. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And when that happens, we should be a people who love justice, who rescue the oppressed, who defend the orphan, who plead for the widow, who cease to do evil and learn to do good. Isaiah spoke, and Isaiah is still speaking. Amen. Let's take a few moments to be quiet. Speak, Lord, for we seek to carry on listening for your voice in your word. Amen. Let's respond to God's word as we use the song, The Heart of Worship, when the music fades. Stand if you're comfortable standing. Remain seated if you prefer. That's fine too. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> 